Congratulations, you've made it to day three. Must feel good. You're uh, not quite halfway, but you're almost there. So you're you're getting you're getting along. You're going at a good pace. You're uh, on the right track. Whatever whatever other saying gets you motivated. Um, I hope that you are getting some sleep. That you are feeling comfortable with the course so far. I hope especially that you've been looking ahead to see what's coming. I think that's always important. I do the same thing with a book. Every time I get a new book, I always look through the table of contents. I leaf through all the chapters. Uh, I do a lot with it actually before I ever start reading it. So hopefully you're doing some of the same things when you're approaching this course. You're looking at each of the days. You're getting an idea for what's coming on. But then when you're doing it, you're actually, remember this is my goal for you, you're actually working through each day in sequence. And for each day, you're working from the top of this page all the way down to the bottom. I don't want you to skip around. I think it makes much more sense if you go in the order that I've laid it out. So having said that, let's work through today, which is the third day of our class, May 20th. First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see here that there's always a link to the live version of the formal course syllabus. The course syllabus simply echoes what's on each of these pages, but this link will be there every day in case you ever decide that you need to look at the syllabus or you want to print it off or whatever, it's there. I do want to remind you that it's a live version. That's why it says that right there, because um, if I have made a mistake or if there's something in there, sometimes I will adjust the syllabus. Uh, I know it's hard to believe that I would ever make a mistake, but it happens occasionally. Uh, so I usually do this live version. So um, always make sure you're checking the version that is linked for that day, because that will be the most up-to-date version. If you're watching the introductory video, you've made it to this spot. There will be a video here as soon as I'm done recording this for you right now. Uh, so you will probably have already seen that. Our objectives for today. All right, we are going to learn how to define an educational problem that needs to be addressed using social entrepreneurship. So how do we think about an educational problem that needs to be addressed for social entrepreneurship? The way that we're going to do that is by creating a plan for social impact. And you'll see what that means in a second. I'm also going to ask you to learn how to craft a value proposition related to the problem statement, all right? A value proposition. So we're going to be thinking about, uh, if, we, if we just sort of skim down here, we're going to thinking, be thinking about a specific case, uh, the case of KIPP National Knowledge is Power Program. You may have heard of it. It's a U.S.-based program, but uh, very interesting. And we're going to think about what it means to be disruptive, and disruptively innovative in education. Right? That's going to help us create value related to our problem statement. And then we're going to think about some of the challenges and opportunities in developing an international educational innovation. Uh, although I will just say right now that some of that is going to be more from how you are thinking about, quite frankly, this video than from any of the specific readings. So keep that in mind. Okay, for the learning modules themselves, the first one is going to be about creating a plan for social impact. I'm going to ask you to read two things. One, I'm just going to skip to number two here, although I know I'm asking you to go in order. I am asking you to read chapter two from this Kellogg Foundation Logic Model Development Guide. You've already read chapters one and three yesterday. Now I'm asking you to go back and read chapter two. Chapter 2 will give you a good idea of how to create this kind of a plan for a, a social for social impact, in this case with the Kellogg Foundation, using their logic model approach. The other thing that I mentioned at the end of uh, my introduction to yesterday's uh, um, lessons was this Woke and Kreitz book, which again, you click on this link, the whole book appears, voila. Um, it's called Business Planning for Enduring Social Impact. I asked you to go ahead and look at it. This is what's going to really help us think about how we create a plan. This is a very much a how-to book. And not a lot of theory, not a lot of highfalutin conceptualization. Uh, it's just how do you make a plan for social entrepreneurship or for social innovation, in our case, an educational or an international educational um, innovation. So you're going to read those two things, and those will help you think about how to create a plan for social impact. The logic model will help you think about how you're thinking about it. That makes sense. 
and the business planning for enduring social impact will help you think about what are you literally writing when you're writing this plan okay next up uh, so many of the days from here on out are going to use a case study approach we're going to look at a particular case and I'm going to as much as I can partner that with a video although not all cases have a video that is a great match um, these cases come from a Stacy Childress's book uh, called transforming public education cases in education entrepreneurship uh, you can see that that's not linked yet because I haven't whoops I haven't put the link up just yet but I will be doing that shortly uh, so hopefully by the time you're watching this there will, there will be a hyperlink here that it will take you right to the uh, the chapter itself I'm excited about that and then I'm going to ask you to watch this video this is Dave Levin he's one of the co-founders of the knowledge is power program uh, KIPP schools are all across the United States they've been remarkably successful especially in poor minority communities um, so as a result there well maybe not as a result I would just say there are a lot of critiques of KIPP um, some of them say that it is uh, exploiting vulnerable situations uh, some say that it is um, reproducing inequality uh, people on the pro side say that it's a breath of fresh air uh, people in the communities where KIPP schools are being opened love it uh, for the most part so there are a lot of different ways to think about it but whichever way you go or whichever side you fall on there is no denying that KIPP is a truly innovative entrepreneurial uh, educational phenomenon and so getting this introduction to it and looking at this case study of how it developed I think will, will really help us remember you're trying to think about let me go back up here how to craft a value proposition related to the problem statement and how to define an educational problem that needs to be addressed using social entrepreneurship this case study is going to help you do that and what I want you to do is you're reading the case study itself and watching this video I want you to think about those two things how do you identify an educational problem or how did they identify an educational problem that needed to be addressed using social innovation and how do they create a value proposition that then becomes part of their problem statement in other words how do they create uh, an understanding of what is valuable or what is needed or what the strength of this innovative approach is how does that happen I think you'll get a lot of that from both the the case study the written case study and the video but maybe a little more of the value thing from the video because he's he's delivering it in what I think is a, a somewhat dynamic way he's no Jesse Jackson but uh, he does he does push it and then I would like for you to read module uh, look at module 3.3 on disruptive innovation in education so we have uh, two people here we have uh, this guy Christensen and then this guy whose name will you'll learn in the video uh, these are two of the bigger names in disruptive innovation in education uh, Christensen in particular is very interested in in higher education uh, this guy is a little more interested in the education system more broadly speaking and right here is being interviewed for I believe a Korean a television show um, so this is where I want you to think not only about what disruptive innovation means because it's a very popular term right now and how disruptive innovation itself is a value proposition but I'd also like for you to think about how much the ideas that this guy is talking about translate outside of the United States to a Korean context to a Bangladeshi context to a Chinese context to a South African context to a Vietnamese or an Indonesian or whatever context all right I want you to think about how this could travel and I want you to hopefully comment on that in uh, the comment section at the end of the day okay application activities you have another quiz Yahoo this is what it looks like put your name in start answering questions hit submit when you're done Next, I would like for you to draft the next section of your strategic plan for an innovative or entrepreneurial educational program or project. This section is called the Overview of Organization section. It is a shorter section than you did yesterday. This one is half as long, no more than 1,500 words, no more than that. 
That means roughly one page single spaced for each of these three bullet points. Okay. What I've done is I've asked you to look at infrastructure, capacity, and sustainability. So now those of you who've had me before, you know that this is my mantra, infrastructure, capacity building, and sustainability. If you want to make anything work, you have to pay attention to these three components. Remember that infrastructure, infrastructure has to do with resources and facilities for the most part. That's, that's the main thing, right? So resources, facilities, personnel, other infrastructure items. Google infrastructure if you need to. But you want to think about what is already in existence. So organization here means uh, whatever you're using as your basis for implementing your innovative idea. That could be a school, that could be a program, that could be a project. Whatever it is, it ends up being an organization. And there's a whole other literature on organizations that we could tap into right now. Just trust me, it's an organization. Okay, so I want you to think about how you're going to be doing what you think you're going to be doing, your innovative idea. And I want you to think about where you're going to be doing it, where are you going to be implementing it, what is the environment or context. You talked about that a little bit yesterday for your assignment, so you already know what that is. And I want you to think very carefully and find any evidence that you can for what resources, facilities, or personnel, or anything else that's infrastructure related, is already there that you can use. In other words, the more infrastructure you can use that already exists, the better. Adding new infrastructure is costly and very hard to sustain. So if there is a building, or if there are computers, or if there is a set of books, or if there are just papers and pens uh, that you can use that's already in existence, that you don't have to spend new money on, that's a win. If you do need to add infrastructure that is new, then you need to tell me what you need beyond what already exists. Okay. Next is capacity. Capacity refers to knowledge and skills. It's the people part of any change or innovation or entrepreneurial thing. It's the people part. What do people know and what, do peop what can people do? Both the people who are implementing the program or the project or the, or the whatever and the people who are the targets or the recipients or the beneficiaries of the innovation. What do they need to know and what do they need to be able to do? This is where you can tap into certainly what already exists, but you can also think about education and training. How do we help people learn what they need to be doing? Or how can they help each other learn? Maybe it's something that, you know, we, being the people who are implementing this, just stay hands off and they run it, whoever they are that is, that is uh, in the thick of it, the target group. And then lastly, I'd like for you to think about sustainability of change. What is the real innovation and entrepreneurship? Well, it's the stuff that is sustained or lasts beyond the initial implementation. This will always involve in include involving stakeholders in the decision-making process and creating ownership among the target population over the innovation. I want you to think about how you are doing that through your school program or project. Last but not least, I would like for you to post comments and questions on uh, this page at the end of the page. I've given you some questions to get you started again, but remember, I'm not going to do this every day, and, and this time I didn't put the prompts in there. I just left it you know, ready for you. So I suggest you address one of these at least. Uh, maybe you have another one, another direction you want to go, great, then do that. But think about how you're engaging with the rest of your class through that discussion board at the bottom, through those comments. That's the only big interaction that you have with the rest of your classmates, and it's super important. All right, I'm encouraging you to always look ahead. I'm encouraging you to always ask questions. Do that every day. You're going to be golden and enjoy the rest of May 20th.